When I was a younger fellow, probably about 13, if I remember correctly, I was at home with my brother, parents were gone, and uh, Jake was doing everything he knew to annoy me. It happens, right? I could do it to him, he could do it to me, this was the time he was doing it to me. And it came to blows, kind of rare actually, and, uh, and Jake ran. He ran down the white tall tile hallway as fast as he could, hung a right into his room, and slammed the door in my face. At this point, I did what a uh, brother does. I went and got a baseball bat, and then proceeded to begin to bash the door in. I remember hearing it split, you know, the veneer attached to the core. I, uh, yeah, I remember hearing that split. And about the time I heard the door start to split, I heard the window open, and Jake jumped out the window. Uh, which was impressive, not because we were on the first floor, but uh, there were those basement window wells right outside the windows. I think they were put there on purpose and uh, in those, that location, and uh, Jake ran. I don't remember how long it was till everyone came home. I don't remember what I told my mom. Happy Mother's Day. I don't remember the punishment. I am sure there was one. Uh, and that, day, that door, as long as we lived there, whenever you closed it, it sort of closed twice because you would close it and the door would, the frame would catch and then the veneer that was separated would catch. It was, uh, just wasn't right. I, I would ask uh, who here has been that angry at a sibling growing up, but I already know the answer. And uh, I would ask what you've done to express that anger, but uh, I don't know if that would be wise. <laughs> Going after my brother's door with a baseball bat may be the single most violent thing I've ever done, uh, but that's how it is with family, right? Family brings out the best in us, and at times it brings out the worst, yet we're still family. Turning to scripture today, we find a story of two brothers, family, Jacob and Esau, and I'm sure if baseball bats had been invented when they were arguing that they would have been explaining to their mother, Rebecca, who hit who first. As we hear this story, we hear about these brothers born as close as they can be, uh, but it's complicated because they live into their names. Esau uh, is this sort of uh, wild man, uh, and, and Jacob, well, Jacob means heel grabber or trickster. Someone who trips you would be a, a trickster, right? And so he lives into his name, and so it's, it's complicated. Esau is the beloved of his father, and Jacob is the beloved of his mother. We read that Esau famished from his days away. Uh, he's out hunting, he comes back, and he is famished. And uh, his brother is there, and it has some stew, some lentil stew, and he offers him a deal. And uh, he offers him quite the deal. Can you imagine walking into the house and being hungry and a sibling looking at you and saying, I'll give you some stew if you give me your car. Right? That's the type of offer he makes, except it's actually worse than that, because what he asks for is his birthright. When a person dies and people inherit the farm, the way the birthright system worked was you take, um, there were two boys, right? So you split the, uh, the, fa the farm into three parts, and the person with the birthright gets two slices. And so if there were five kids, you'd split it into six parts, and the eldest would get two, two, uh, a third, and the other, everyone else would split six. But since there were only two, uh, two uh, boys there, they would, they would split it two-thirds, one-third. And so Esau has just given away a third of the farm for a bowl of soup, which is uh, quite an expensive bowl of soup. Family dinners must have been awkward those years, especially since Esau, living into his uh, name, he marries two women, two Hittite women, who are a source of grief, is what scripture tells us. And the day comes when Isaac realizes it's time to pass down leadership of the family, of the family, the family farm, and uh, he wants to give leadership of the family to Esau. Because Esau, even if Esau's only gonna get one third of the farm, he, he's the, he wants Esau to be the leader. But Jacob is preferred by Rebekah. And so when Isaac sends Esau out and says, go hunt something, bring it back, we'll have a meal, I'll give you the blessing, and, and you'll be the head of the family. Well, Rebekah hears this, and as soon as Esau leaves the room, she gets Jacob and has, tells him, you need to impersonate your brother. Uh, I'll cook something, so you're, and Esau was taught to cook by his mama, we can guess, so I mean, she can trick him like that. And Jacob says, well, my, my dad's not going to go for it. And uh, the, Rebecca says, well, he is blind. So put on this goat skin. You'll feel just like your brother. You know he's pretty hairy. And uh, we'll see if we can pull this off. And so they do it. And Jacob is blessed. The blessing is, uh, now may God give you the dew of heaven, the fatness of the earth, the abundance of the grain and wine. 
May people serve you, bow down before you, and you will be the master of your brothers. And Esau returns, and his brothers got the blessing. His, his brother is now the head of the family. And Esau's had enough at this point. Esau has lost a third of the farm, and now he's no longer going to be leader of the family. And uh, Rebecca, the mom, hears Esau muttering, I'm going to kill him, I'm going to kill him, I'm going to kill him. And uh, so Rebecca says to Jacob, you're not married yet. Why don't you go find a wife? Go talk to your uncle Laban. You know, the, your uncle who lives a couple days travel away, far away from your brother. Go talk to him. Go find yourself a wife. And so he does. He goes off to work for his uncle Laban. And uh, the trickster, Jacob, he gets tricked. He says he'll work uh, seven years to marry the younger daughter, Rachel. And on the wedding night, uh, Laban slips in uh, Leah, the older daughter. And so he, he wakes up next to the, the wrong woman in the morning. That would have been a tense family discussion, I'm sure. The, the point at which Laban says, you know, it's not customary for us to marry off the younger daughter first. I'm sure uh, Jacob would have asked, could you have told me that seven years ago, please? Right. Uh, but they come to another agreement. Uh, he'll work another seven years and he'll get the other daughter. And, and so he, you can have the other daughter right now, but work for me another seven years. And so uh, he works 14 years and then another six. And so he's gone for 20 years. And, and then he decides it's time to go home. And I'm glossing over about three or four just amazingly fun stories. But he, he decides he's going he's to head home and he takes his two wives, two maids, 12 children, huge flock, and they start heading home. And uh, Rebecca, his mom, has got to be ecstatic about this. Can you imagine not seeing your, a child for 20 years, and then he's going to show up, and he's going to show up with two wives and 12 grandchildren, 12 brand new grandchildren, right? And she's got to be worried, though, because Esau, the older brother, he gets together the welcoming party, and it's 400 men. How big of a flock, how big of a herd do you need to have that you have 400 men handy to go with you? Think about how big of a farm you have to have, that you have 400 hired hands. And so he gets together the hired hands, 400 hired hands, and they go out to meet uh, Jacob. And Jacob hears that his brother is coming with 400 people, and he is terrified. And so he starts going through all of his flock, right, uh, and, and picks out some of the finest that he has. And he starts sending groups of lambs and camels and his, uh, whatever, any, any livestock he can, he can send. He sends forward in groups with servants leading them. And, and as his brother Esau comes, comes across these groups, he tells them, tell my brother, this is for you. This is for you. And so he, it's like a little traveling pack of Christmas presents heading towards his brother. 510, 510 head of livestock show up. That's how many head of livestock Esau is given by his brother Jacob as they, he is approaching. And so Jacob meets Esau, and uh, Jacob apologizes all over himself, and Esau says, what's with all the, what's with all the cattle, brother? And uh, Jacob says, oh, it's all yours. Take it. It's a gift. Seriously. Um, and Esau doesn't give anything back. And in that culture... You know, if I gave one of you 500 head of cattle, you'd, you'd do something for me, wouldn't you? Right? Something. I don't know what. Maybe a nice pocket knife or two. Right? But uh, if I give you 500 head of cattle and the other person just takes it, there's something going on there. And, and I, I, my guess is that Jacob is trying to... He had taken his brother's birthright for a cup of stew a few of 20 years ago. I think he's trying to square up. Right, he's trying to hear, here, here, have an entire herd of the finest animals I have. Are we square now? And, and Esau, they, they hug, they're happy, they're overjoyed. They're square. They're family, right? Rebecca has her two new uh, daughters-in-law, 12 grandchildren, and, and they're family again. Family, you know, family brings out the worst in us, brings out the best in us, but they they're still managed to be family. Another story of family, in 1844, the Methodist Church got together. Every four years, the Methodist Church gets together to have a long meeting. Oh, my Lord, a long meeting. This meeting lasted a month and a week, and uh, it just went on forever and ever. This meeting of the church split the church because, you see, there was this bishop, Bishop Andrew, and he had slaves. 
And, and so they had this argument about what they should do. The North wanted the, the, the Southern Bishop, Bishop Andrew, to get rid of his slaves. And so the church split into the Methodist Church South, we're standing in a Methodist Church South, and the Methodist Church North, that brick building down the road from us, that's a Methodist Church North. And so this impacted even Milan, the, this argument that they had. And so this Bishop, Bishop Andrews, was the cause of this argument, and it's family, right? It's complicated. You can't just say it's because someone had slaves. That was the argument. Well, Bishop Andrews had, Andrew hadn't actually bought slaves. He had married a woman whose first husband had died, and she had inherited slaves. And so Bishop Andrew married a woman who had inherited slaves. So it's not like he was involved in buying slaves. And it's not like he had hundreds of slaves. He had two. Right? He, there was a small young boy who you couldn't free anyways, because where would he go? And then there was a teenage girl who didn't want to go anywhere. Right? So two slaves. And uh, it was illegal for him to let them go anyways in, in the state of Georgia. But again, it gets more complicated. Family, it's always complicated. Uh, there was a difference in understanding of how power worked. In the North, they elected a bishop to do what they told them, right? The General Conference would get together every four years, they would elect a few bishops, and they would tell the bishop, now over the next four years, we want you to do A, B, C, and D, get back to us in four years, and we'll, you can tell us how you've been doing on doing what we told you to do. In the South, the idea of the bishop was, you elect the bishop, and then you say, yes, sir. Right? You elect the bishop, and okay, bishop, you've got four years to do what you want, and in four years, if we don't like you, we'll elect someone else. And so there's a very big difference in how the power of a bishop worked. And so when the North started telling a Southern bishop what to do, the Southern churches went, oh, you don't tell a bishop what to do. Right? And so it's an argument about slaves. It's an argument about power. It's about an argument about how the church works with itself. And the church split. It actually ended up before the Supreme Court arguing about uh, who got the bookstore. It was a really big deal. After decades, more decades than it took for Jacob and Esau to get back together. After decades, the church got back together in 1939, and some things had changed. The North wasn't worried about bishops being little dictators, and the South, well, the Civil War had happened. The whole slavery thing had changed. And so they got back together, and uh, just like with Jacob and Esau coming back together, there were still some things, right? Still some problems to be worked out. But Mama was happy. Rebecca was pleased. Right? That, that's how that worked. And, and so that new Methodist church, when P, the two churches came together, you think Mama was happy? Who, who's Mama when churches get back together? Who is it that, uh, whose family is it that split? Uh, I believe it's God's. God who is uh, the Mama in this situation. It's God's family, and so God is the one who grieves when the church splits, and God is the one who is pleased when they come back together, because it's, it's family. It's God's family, and family brings out the best and the worst. Well, both the Bible and our own history talk about how we split at times, and then get back together, and, and how there's always, we are going to get back together because we're still family. And uh, we still have General Conference. The General Conference that happened in 1844, there's another one that's going to start. Not today, it starts Tuesday. It starts over in Portland, Oregon. It doesn't last a month and week like it used to. Now it lasts 10 days, 864 delegates, all-day meetings, 10 days with 1,044 pieces of legislation. As with the General Conference back in the 1840s, we're going to have a hard argument in front of us as the Methodist Church. We're actually going to be celebrating the anniversary of a different hard argument. 60 years ago this year, we decided to ordain women. Glad that worked out. Uh, and this year, we're going to have another family argument. And we're going to argue about one sentence. Here's that sentence. The practice of homosexuality is incompatible with Christian teaching. That sentence is just going to be... I can't tell you how many hours that's going to be spent arguing about that sentence this, these coming two weeks. As with any family argument, it's complicated, very complicated, right? Because you see the Methodist church is growing by leaps and bounds in Africa and South Korea. And it, uh, 10 years ago when they had annual conference, I think it was 12 years ago, they had uh, 700 delegates from America and 100 delegates from overseas. Now they have 500 delegates from America and 300 delegates from overseas. And so all the, propos all the proposals, all the decisions that are being put forward are all being handled in the context of there's a changing authority because Asia and Africa have different understandings of, well, a lot. 
<laughs> and so right now, if you went online and looked up General Conference Portland, Oregon Methodist Church, you're going to find people who are arguing to not touch anything, not change anything, just please, just don't mess with it, just don't break it, right? There are going to be people, you're going to find people arguing that we need to change everything, we need to let everyone do everything, relax. There are people who are going to say we need to have, tighten up all standards and, and so have a whole bunch of church trials and, and start really tightening the screws down, and, and if it's the book of discipline, we need to have discipline. And then there are going to be people that you will find who are arguing for completely rejiggering the entire church, potentially splitting it. All right? You're going to find all of those arguments, and God help you if you go into the comments sections, because we get rather graceless in that place. I read of apocalyptic fears for the future of the church. That's going to be a train wreck. And in the, I read others who say, you know what, we're going to keep on being the church. Here we go. In the end, the family is going to stay the family, uh, and that's how it's going to happen. I'm not particularly worried about the future of the church in that if Jacob and Esau could get back together, if the church could split and get back together, well, I mean, I went after Jake's uh, door with a baseball bat and I ended up best man at his wedding, right? I believe that family, it brings out the best in us, it brings out the worst in us. Maybe something big will happen at General Conference. Maybe not much at all. I, I don't know. But I know that Mom was looking out for the family, drawing them back together, because we're still going to be family. If you can go to this next, there's a picture. If you can go to this next picture. Uh, these are the people who will be at General Conference. They've actually flown there already. They're uh, going to Portland. And they are from Missouri. Uh, Matt Miofsky from St. Louis, and that's Karen Hayden, and she's from Columbia, and Andy Bryan in Springfield, and uh, Jill Wandell, she just lived in Hannibal, and Emmanuel Cleaver III, and uh, Shannon Meister, she's from Queen City uh, up this way, and Bob Farr, and, and he's from over in St. Louis. I, I know all these folks, right? I, I know all of them. Um, we voted on them last year. They're going to go and represent us in this world gathering. What I'm going to ask you to do over these coming days, starting Tuesday, is uh, pray for them. As you go out, there's a list of all of these names, as well as the places that you can find information on General Conference about what happens as it unfolds, because there are a lot of other topics for discussion as well. But I'm going to invite you to join with me in praying for them, that they might be wise, patient, and humble, that they might reflect God's love, God's holiness, and at the end they might act for the good of God's family. Amen.